gracious to offer our gratitude. And uh, uh, Claudette does such a great job with that every every year. Can you say amen? amen. And, and she'll be uh, bringing the word, and, and uh, uh, it, it, there'll be uh, it's a whole program. That, uh, so you'll enjoy next next Sunday at the church. How many of you think that perhaps you could uh, uh, you could be a brighter light? How many thinks that perhaps you could uh, experience a, the, the relationship with God where you could walk on water, as we've described over those several weeks? Well, two, three. <laughs> We're all water walkers, but to, to what degree? And how many believes that you can do a better job with your testimony? Amen. With your, how many knows that you're the light of God? Amen. Yeah, God's light is in you. So if that's the case, how many would like to be a brighter light? Amen. Well, thank the Lord. After church, we're going to split a cake out here for this guy right here. Uh, <laughs> would you like to come up and say a word, Brian? Well, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, tell us uh, how you got here as much as you want to tell. But most importantly, uh, tell us what this church means to you. Okay? No, you got to have a mic. I'm not celebrating cake without your testimony. Hey everybody, Southside Family Church. Uh, I speak better off the cuff, so uh, you know, um, you know, for me to do this is, uh, you know, a last minute notice is okay. And if I had warning, I would have been nervous. It's all get up. You know? <laughs> so uh, I mean, you guys are my family. Uh, I was in a very dark place, really quick. Um, a lot of you know where I was. Um, a year ago, September, you know, I lost my fiance from cancer. She lasted eight months, and um, she was a hematologist, oncologist, and what she loved to do, be her. And I was in a very dark place when I came here. And I'm a personal trainer, <clears throat> and uh, I was training a young man that lives like right behind her in some rooms. And uh, he was shooting hoops, and I was about training, and that's when I met Pastor Sean. And so, uh, and I just pulled up and we connected right away. Justin was here, and right away I felt at home. Like, I was hurting. I was talking to my priest in Philadelphia from South Philly every day, almost. And he's like, you know what? God will be anything you want him to be. You know, he'll be your punching bag. He'll be anything. But he's always there for you. My priest told me to tell him. You know? And I still couldn't get it. I'm like, why? Why would you take her? You know? So, um, anyway, I came here. I met Pastor Shell, and he told me about his loss with his wife. You know? And he's like, pull over, son. And he gave me a tour of the church. And Justin came out and prayed me in the parking lot, put his hand on my shoulder. I'm like, wow. I felt relief for the first time. Right? You know, my heart opened. My heart opened, and I was like, wow, I found a home. I found a home. You know, I mean, God loves me. He supports me. You know, he's never dropped me in my head ever. Always had my back. Everything in my life, I know he's always been there, but this time is a tough time. It's a tough struggle. So, anyway, I'm blessed to be here. Thank you, Pastor Shaw. I love this man with a father. All right. He's a Catholic background, and he calls me father. So some of you, I say that because I want some of you to step up. Thank you, Brian. So my question this morning is, do we wrestle with God? Yeah. I think I uh, yeah. Do we wrestle with God? 
there will be a, a different concept or a different slant on this, so I, I hope that you pay attention and uh, uh, study it yourself. Because I'm going to tell you a couple of things that may go against, or tell us a couple of things that goes against our, our thought process, perhaps. But how many times have we said in the name of Jesus, and not much happens? Right? We have no strength. We have no power. We have no authority in your own name. Don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how long you've uh, sat and read the word. You have no authority, no power in your own name. That's right. I am a Christian, but nothing of significance happens of myself. I can go through life, and I, and I have been caught very guilty of that, of thinking that I, I'm a fixer. I can fix things. And some things you can fix, some things you can work out, but not those things that need power, not those things that require authority. Our movement, our being as disciples is all in God and not in ourselves. And folks, we must recognize that the connection between the believer and a victorious life is the connector's relationship with the one that gives victory. And that is God Almighty. Now Jacob entered into a place he had never been before on this particular night. Do we wrestle with God? Go to Genesis. Let me read that one, that verse. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons and crossed the Jabuk River with them, after taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. There's a reason for reading that first verse. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it, left the mark. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. You have fought with God and with men and you have won. What in the world does that mean? There's some things, uh, frankly, that we just kind of skip over when we're studying the Word because we really can't wrap our minds around certain thoughts, and this might be one of them. So Jacob entered into this place he had never been before on this particular night. But when it was over, he was a totally changed man. How did that happen? What happened on that spot on that particular night? What took place? And I think back at the times of my life when something really drastic took place. A change was, took place in my heart. My whole attitude and everything changed about me. And I try to figure out what in the world happened. Yes, we know it was a spiritual uh, relationship. It was a spiritual endeavor. But how did that spiritual relationship evolve? How did it take place? And I'm suggesting to you that Jacob wrestled with God himself. God became a man in that instance, and he wrestled with Jacob. And he was a real man of flesh and blood, just like Jacob. And he wrestled with him, and no, it was not all the night. As a matter of fact, he got up and he took his, his family across the river. They were about to meet Esau and came back. So uh, longevity is, is not the answer to this sermon. But when he came back at some point in time, probably around 3, 4 o'clock, I would think with the time span that it would have taken to have done, to have crossed over, because he wanted them to go ahead because they were the offering for his brother. 
He still was manipulating. He was figuring things out, trying to fix things. And then he goes back and gets to get a little bit of sleep. Some say that he was a, a bit of a coward. He wanted to see how his brother would treat his family before he crossed over for forgiveness. There's a lot of thoughts there that you could look at. But he comes back thinking that he's just coming back to take a nap. And in that nap or in that uh, two or three, four hour period, somebody visited him, woke him up and said, let's fight. Let's wrestle. Not so much fight. So forget I, I, I mentioned, put that word in. Let us wrestle. And so in that process of wrestling, now, by, by the way, I've got two grandsons right now that are in wrestling school, wrestling, and, and they're always getting hurt. Uh, that's a, you know, you have to, uh, you have to, there's a discipline to wrestling. And I, I'll teach this before we go any further. And part of that discipline is the diet. You, you have a certain weight category, and, and if, uh, I, I know my brother was a, a wrestler, believe it or not. Uh, and so here, you've got a weight category here, and if you overeat, then you're put up here, and you're dealing with a guy that's a lot stronger and, and so forth, and, and you're probably going to get whipped. So you're going to do anything you can do to stay in this category, because that's your best chance to what? Win. And you even work hard so you can get down here. Though you're strong enough to be here, you'd like to win. So if I lose just three more pounds, I get here and I get a, a medal. I, get, I, I win. And so the discipline of wrestling is a pretty strenuous thing. You don't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a wrestler. You'd get, your, you, you'd get every muscle in your body pulled out. Wouldn't be able to do anything probably for months. You have to tone yourself. You have to get in condition. You have to work at becoming a wrestler. Well, Jacob sleeping. Jacob was a, a, a working man, so that he had some strength. And all of a sudden, he's visited by a guy who wants to wrestle him. Now, there are, se there are several proofs in the scripture that God indeed wrestles, or the angels and God wrestles with men. Jacob recognized him as the blesser. Now remember, he was promised the blessing, and Jacob recognized him as the blesser. You can't just say that, oh, I'm, I, am, I am blessed without being blessed. You, you can't just say, uh, I, I'm, I am special without knowing that you're special and feeling that you're special. And so Jacob recognized right away, this is a man that I don't want to let go. Because though he was promised, listen to me, though he was promised the blessings of his father, they had not materialized yet. And so here he is recognizing that this is the man who's going to bless me. And so he hung on. The blessing he, hoped, he received from God was only one that God could give. No one else could give it. Amen. Now, one of, the, one of the situations in mankind is we always think there's other things that can appease us or give us what we want. If we're disciples of, of Christ, if we're followers of the Lord, we have to know that God is the giver of all things. He's the one that redeemed us. He's the one that called us. And now he's the one that blesses us. Amen. And I'm not speaking here of the blessings that we get in praise and worship. I'm not speaking here of the, of the feel good and the feel better blessings. I'm talking about when a man is blessed with the path of God on his life. Yeah. When he knows beyond a doubt that he is doing what God wants him to do and being what God wants him to be. We settle, we settle for, for less than that in our lives. Already, he was God's chosen nation. Already it had been a, a blessing had been promised. Already in this prophetic, he was in the prophetic line for the birth of Jesus. All, all things were falling in place. It was all, but there was something missing. Just because you have the promise of eternal life, which we do, just because you know you're going to heaven, there's something missing in your life if you're not allowing God to direct your life on this earth. 
And we can we can blame others. We can we can blame every situation. Oh, I'm just not. I'm just not. I'm just not. I can't. But in reality, if you really want joy in this world, we've got to be blessed of God on this earth. My soul and my heart is blessed because it's fixed in eternity. But from day to day, I may go through life without the blessing of this earth, on this earth. God calls us a light for a reason. He calls us his cherished ones for a reason. So, what was missing? His heart towards God. Well, pastor... He was, he was chosen. He was placed. Wasn't his heart towards God? No. He understood the history. He understood what had happened. He understood that, that all, all the, the prophecies that was told and described to him, it had been taught to him. He understood, but there was something missing. His heart was not to God. Where, where, where was his heart? Well, first of all, his heart was to women. Can we all say praise the Lord for women? As a matter of fact, he chose a couple, and then they couldn't have children fast enough, so they, they gave their representatives. This man was was something else. And and he yes, he had hundreds of grandchildren and so forth and so forth. That was it, that was his priority is to replenish the earth, to bring in this this family, this movement uh, uh, of the promise of Abraham. He wanted family more, he loved family. He loved family. You know what else he loved? He loved wealth. Everywhere he went, he dug wells. He raised sheep. God blessed him, and God blessed him, and God blessed him. He said, I am a pretty cool dude. I've got, I've got a great bunch of family members all over. I've got wealth untold. I am in good, good shape. But isn't that pretty much like us? If, if we make enough to pay our bills or, or more than our bills require, don't we feel pretty content? Don't we feel pretty good if, if help is in our family and everything's going smooth? Don't we feel pretty content? There's a lot of Jacob in us. A lot of Jacob in us. Now I'll tell you what else is in him. He was tricked. He tricked his brother. He took his brother's birthright. We, we know that story. I won't go into it. We just, we've been sharing it for a couple of weeks. So he manipulated his brother to where his brother gave, him, gave up his birthright. If Jacob would have had the right heart when his brother came in for food, he would have just simply made him a bowl of soup and given it to him. Well, come on, say amen. amen. If what you do for God is manipulation, it's just not really acceptable. If how you serve God is just because you're, you're manipulating or you, there's some kind of praise or honor or dignity that, that you want or elevation or title, it's just not acceptable. I'm trying to tell us here in a moment how we're going to deal with these things. But here, he had all this going. Uh, he, he deceived his own, I tell you, he had no prejudice. He deceived his own father. First his brother and then his father. Let me tell you what makes it worse. His mother jumped on board and said, let me help you deceive my husband. Oh, mothers, mothers. I'm thankful for my mother. I'm so thankful for my mother. You know what she knew well and how to do it is to hit me on the back of my head. So that it didn't kill me, but I knew that she'd hit me on the back of my head. Now today she'd be arrested, of course. <laughs> But just just a little tap on the back of my head, just, I mean, I still hear the sound that brings back so many moments. And it was done so often. So often. When I did something, when I stepped out of line, when I said something, and I was always saying something or, or whatever, uh, th that little tap on the back of my head reminded me. I, I probably, because the tap would go lower several times. Now that's a mother. When I tried to deceive, and I, I did so, I was I was just really good at it with my with my siblings. I was I was up there, and they were down here in the elderly in the age bracket, and I was very effective, except for my mom. She caught every trick. 
Every, every, every time I planned something, she was able to find it. I would say to this, you're not helping your family members if you help them in their deceptive ways. You're, you're not helping your brother and sister if you support their deception, if you support their manipulation. Are, are we listening carefully? You're, you're not helping. As a matter of fact, you're becoming like Jacob's mother. You're enabling him. Matter of fact, she got in and helped with the plan of how to deceive. What in the world is that all about? Well, that's who Jacob was. That was his character. So I ask you the question, how could this man go on and accomplish God's plan in the condition he was in? He was a manipulator. He was a deceiver. And it started the very roots of his own family. How in the world could God give that promise or fulfill that promise that he gave to Father Abraham with this kind of man? What is going on? He was a chief of deception. So what could he change? How could he change who he was? How can you change who you are? I know you're sitting here right now listening and you're saying, well, I, I'd, like, I'd like this part of, of me not to exist. How in the world can that happen? Deceit is simply man's method of manipulation. That's all it is. I'll deceive so that I can manipulate. There's a whole part of the country right now that's really, really mad. And you know what they're most mad about? They're most mad because their news agencies lied to them. I hear it all the time. They, are, they feel deceived. You don't mind a fairness, but, but if, if something's unfair when it's believed, it's a believed to be a lie or it's believed to be a truth, and it's not, and it's not either. Nobody wants to be lied to. Nobody wants to be deceived. Nobody wants to be manipulated. And here is this man, the father, coming out of the nations, and he's coming out, and that's what he represents. What in the world do we do about that? What did he do about it? How could Jacob say in the next instance that I won? Okay. Jake, uh, I got my pages mixed up. Jacob had a character change. How was it? How was it? In this wrestling match that he, that he performed or practiced in, participated in, he had a direct encounter with God. It's not something you read about. It's not something that you can just talk to your neighbor about. That's not how you get where God wants you to be. It's not how your light shines brighter. It's not how you overcome a deceptive heart. A direct encounter with God is required. That means he wrestled with God. Now I'm going to work on this word of, of wrestling, why it's so important that we wrestle with God. Because we hear, I know right away your mind's clicking, oh, pastor, we wrestle with, we wrestle with uh, darkness. We wrestle with the enemy. I don't. I struggle with it in my mind sometimes. I don't wrestle with it. What in the world, what in the world does the enemy have on me? The word says I'm blood bought, born again, and I'm property of the king. Amen. The word says I absolutely belong to God. Amen. So the word wrestle, the, the term of wrestling here does not deal with that fact I'm wrestling with the devil. Why are you spending so much time with him in the first place? I'm not going to let him get that close to me. Say amen, folks. Amen. Listen to me now. He had a direct encounter with God. He wrestled with God. Are you directly encountering God in your daily lives? Amen. Am I directly going to God for every need in my life, for every situation in my life? Am I putting it on Him? Am I resting in His, the assurance that He's going to deliver me? Oh, yeah, Pastor, I do. Every Sunday, I can drop by and say hello to God. <laughs> okay, let me say that again because not enough of you felt what I feel. Oh, it's Sunday. I'm going to drop in and say hello to God. That's not an encounter with God. Amen. That's a blessing. Amen. <laughs> Lord, it's time to give you two hours of my heart, two hours of my time, and it need not ever go over that. 
Lord, I know that I'm the light. I just don't pay attention to how bright you want me to be. It's just not a top concern of mine that I be the brightest that I can be for the glory of God. I know my character is flawed, but it's too invasive for me to go into your presence and allow the Holy Spirit to fix me. Does any of this ring a bell to our minds and our hearts? It, it does bind. Or are we deceiving ourselves by saying, there's not much I can get from God that I, already, that I don't already have. There's not much of a relationship that I can obtain, attain that I don't already exist in. Because we, I am the chosen of God. I am blood bought. You are. But my friend, there's something more. God has a plan for your life just like Jacob. Amen. He has a plan for your life. And that is that important to us. Amen. God has a plan for this church, this body, this fellowship. Is that important to us? Amen. Does that have value to us? There are many churches over the land today that are meeting and, and uh, they're filled with Christians that are called, I call the couch laying believer. You know what a couch laying believer is? A believer who lays on the couch <laughs> and is perfectly content to be there. Not realizing that God has us on the earth to be his light. God has us on the earth to represent the character of Christ. And we're not anxious to get rid of the part of the character that does not represent him. We let it lie within us. And instead, if you wrestle with God, you can overcome that and you can be the representative Christ wants you to be. Peter got out of the boat. The, other, the rest of them was just caught lounging. Lounging in fear. How and why should we wrestle with God? We're forgiven. We've come out of sin. But you know what we do? We drag our flesh with us. My flesh is still alive. You know, there's parts of it that's not working like it used to, but it's still alive. I got things in my ears. I got things on my eyes. You know what I'm talking about. And so we drag this flesh right on with us throughout our life. How should we and why should we wrestle with God? Because that flesh is always the avenue of which Satan can attack us. He has no access to the work of the spirit that's done in my heart. But my friend, he has total access to the flesh of man. He demonstrated that with Jesus. And each time Jesus, the man, the flesh Jesus, rebuked him by the authority of of God the Father. You understand? There was a connection there between God and Christ, God and man, that just existed so that he was able to dispel that. And I'm suggesting to you that we must have that connect, connection within our own lives in order to live a victorious life. I don't want to just live on this earth. I want to live victoriously. Amen. I want to have the joy of the Lord bubbling in my heart. What are the things that hold you down? What are the things that trouble you the most? Some part of your, your being that you're just not satisfied with or that's not, it, it's not pleasing you. It may, it may be our, our financial uh, affairs. It may be our, our marital affairs. It may be our friendship affairs. It may be just the fact that we're not, we don't feel elevated. We don't feel appreciated. All of those things, you know what they have in, in common? They're, they're attacked to your flesh. They're part of your flesh, man. And so Jacob went into, went into this encounter with God and all these things was hanging on him. And he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Amen. I'm not going to do it. And that's the point I'm, I'm stressing this morning. We are lounging around as Christians. We are children of light. We have all victory. Oh my, we need not, when we die, we go, this Martha Johnson is going to come up out of the grave. Praise be to God because of her faith. But in this world, I want to be God's man. I want to be a Jacob. And so should you. And so do you. Say amen. Amen. 
God has a plan for your life, just like he had for, for Jacob. Amen. Is it important to us? So when we come out of sin, we drag every ounce of flesh, every flesh with our flesh with us. Satan has no access. First, why do we feel like we are wrestling with Satan? This needs to be discussed with the, the whole idea of wrestling. Because who wants to do that? Don't give him that kind of attention in your life. Don't say the devil's picking on me. He's picking on you because your, your flesh is, he has access to your flesh. He has no power but the flesh, so deal with the flesh. Are you listening to me? Don't, don't deal with the idea, oh man, he just pick, he picks, he tries to pick on, you know why I don't pick on some that we, because they have died to the flesh. Amen. They have taken care of the flesh. How do you do that? You wrestle with God. Now, wrestling doesn't mean fighting. It doesn't mean kicking and scratching. It means, it means wrestling, holding on tight, trying to subdue, trying to conquer, trying to walk away with a medal, trying to walk away as a winner. Why spend time and energy with someone who is not or who is out to destroy you? Why let that even in your mind? Why does the enemy, why, why do we let the enemy access our brain when we know he wants to destroy us? All of this is the character traits of flesh. Jacob was laden with it. I don't mind. Satan's going to attack us. That, that doesn't, doesn't frighten me. What, what really frightens me to some degree is if we don't understand that he's already defeated. He understands it. That's why he's so angry and mad. So you claim it, you speak to it, tell him he's already defeated, but you, you don't wrestle with him. You don't spend time in your mind going over and think, oh, this is the devil. I think the devil's out to get me. I think the devil's trying to, uh, yeah, yeah, he's doing that. He does that all, but it's okay because he has no power. He's doing only what he can do. He's doing the works of darkness. So how could Jacob say that he won? Because let's read that verse. Let's see. Your name will, uh, yeah. Your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. How in the world can we consider him a winner? He wrestled with God and in God's presence, he won because he allowed God's character to become his. Now, the reason I know that is because he was a changed man from this day on. He administered his life different. He took care of things and saw things differently than ever before. He became in that, that lineage of Christ. He became, he, he worked and responded to the plan that God had for his life. But my friend, it would, not have, it would not have been so good had he not spent that night wrestling with God, struggling with God. What are we struggling against? Well, what is that wrestling all about? It's, it's my flesh struggling. It's my flesh that doesn't want to leave me. It's my will, my, my desire, my want to, to, to appease myself. And it just will not leave me. It will not depart. But I struggle and I surround Christ, uh, God. I put my arms around him. I seek his face. I read his word. I pray. I honor him and I lift him high in my life. And I will win over my flesh. My friend, the, the whole idea of, of wrestle means a struggle. And so you, you're not going to win if, if, uh, if it's a day at the beach, if Christianity is a day at the beach with you. It's not, you're not going to win. You only win in prayer and supplication before the Lord. That doesn't mean 24-7. That's why people say, oh, he prayed, he wrestled all night long. He didn't. He wrestled two to four hours, uh, as best I can tell. Sometimes we say, oh, if you pray 14 days straight without stopping. No, you pray, you pray, you wrap your arms around God, and, so, and if it takes longer, it's because your flesh is more stubborn, you're not wanting to let it go. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't get religious about your relationship with God. 
Don't get religious. It's got to be this way because it's always been this way and it will always be no it won't. Whatever, you, when you enter into that throne room, when you enter that relationship of struggling with God, praise God, when that thing is delivered, when you know that character is gone, that trait is gone, and the one that replaces it is one of Jesus Christ, you have won. Amen. You have won. And it's not a one-night affair. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not a, a period of time. Sometimes it's months and so forth because you are you are seeking victory. You are seeking victory. And so you're going to hang on and you're going to continue to struggle. You're going to continue with, with God and you're going to wrap your arms around him. Why are you struggling with God? Because the flesh doesn't want to let go. God will not let go and the flesh doesn't want to let go. So that wrestling, that struggling with God is actually yourself struggling to become submissive to what God wants in, in your life. I hope you, you're getting some of this. Amen. Jacob wanted the evidence of his flesh to be defeated. He encountered God in order to conquer his flesh. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> he encountered God to conquer his flesh. He met God. And the purpose was, you see, here, here's the point with, uh, he was a deceiver, but he was not deceived. He knew the kind of man that he was. Okay, listen to me, folks. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us what you, you need to do. He will reveal to you the areas in your life that you need to surrender to him, that you need to conquer. Are you deceived? Because Jesus talks about it all the time. He says there's many that's deceived and they're deceiving others. Yes. The honesty of the Spirit, when you come to God, you come to Him right, and, and all of a sudden He reveals to you what needs to be or, or the part of you that's not like Christ. What, what do you do about that? If you deny it, you'll go nowhere. But if you accept it and then you wrestle with God, you get into that encounter with him and all of a sudden, praise God, over some period of time and maybe instantly you are delivered. That's where the name of Jesus comes in. Amen. The authority of Christ. And now you can live your life in the name of Jesus and with the authority of Christ because that flesh part has been dismantled. He wanted to live a victorious life. So he recognized that the flesh had to be conquered. The flesh itself, let me throw this point at you. Your flesh itself cannot defeat the enemy, cannot, cannot, cannot overcome the enemy. That's where you get into, well, a positive mental attitude or, or uh, if I just speak it, okay, I'll, it'll be so. No, it won't. If your flesh speaks it, it won't. It doesn't do any good at all. You can say, oh, I don't really, uh, I, I, I command that this be gone. Well, it's not going to go. Not from the flesh, but from the Holy Spirit. Amen. The authority of the Holy Spirit. And you can't have that authority, you can't exercise that authority until you have wrestled with God to the point that your flesh is totally submissive or, or it's rejected and you accepted the character of Christ. I know we seek for easy chair relationship, and I know that it's, uh, it's predominantly all over in this, in this country. Do you know it's not that way in other places? I've got something I want to read to you if I could. I sure hope I, I brought it along. Maybe not. There's a pastor in... Uh, Why do I do that? That kind of stuff. Does anybody know? Okay. There's a pastor in one of the African nations. He's a tall gentleman, strong. I was so amazed at, 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 as I looked at him. He looked like he, he looked like a, a, a young or a middle-aged David or with a statue of, of Samson. He just oh. 
And here he is, the pastor. You know what his pastor, you know what his church is? About a thousand tents. You know how big these tents are? The size of a mattress. One double size, double thin mattress goes in this tent. And when he goes to bed at night, do you know how many people is in that tent? He has seven children, he and his wife, and he says usually he invites one or two others in that doesn't have a place to go. And that's where they sleep, that's where they live, that's their home. And this nation allows them, it's an Islamic nation, I believe, allows them to just stay there and there's tents and tents and tents. And he comes out and he walks down the, the narrow path in between the tents. He said, this is your pastor. Good morning. This is your pastor. We'll be, we'll be you know, and, and they, they, there's too many of them to gather in one place. But he goes through all the tents preaching and talking about God. I, I surrender to you that God is such a big God. And he's got such beautiful plans for every one of us. But sitting in the easy chair is not one of them. Propping up at the beach, I'm not talking literally, but just relaxing and saying, I'm waiting on the Lord to come back. I want you to know something. Christianity is growing faster than you can imagine. Do you know that according to prophecy, Iran will be Christianized before the time, the end? Iran. That's Bible prophecy. How in the world is it happening? Well, let me tell you just, just one thought. The Ayatollah, Ayatollah is so uh, angry and, and, and wants to hurt everybody and so forth, but the people, they don't like that. One of the fastest growing nations in Christianity is Iran. Is that not amazing? Yeah. They have to keep it secret, but yet it's growing and it's growing. Oh, and getting back to this pastor, he, he says, they leave us alone as long as we don't go outside of this area and spread the good news. Now, is that the very opposite of what Paul said? I am here to bring the good news. Tell, he tells the church, go out and give the good news. Is it, is it, uh, do we not understand that when a law is passed that, that you can't take this book anywhere or in the public places? That is, the purpose of that is to stop the good news? I feel like this morning that I need to wrestle with God more than I ever have in my life. Wrestle with God to the point that I get what he wants for me, and I get to put what I think I want for me in total submission and cast it from me. One of the problems with Christianity are words like this. That's just the way I am. And another one that I disdain is that's just me. Well, that's the problem. You see, that's why we need to go and have just me taken from me. And in its place, just him placed in me. Yeah. Oh, those are poison words. That means that I'm, I'm just lazy and I don't want to change. I don't want to wrestle with God. I don't want my life to be different no matter what it is. And another word that I've picked up and I've decided not to even talk to this person until they quit saying that. That shows you my mercy. I've talked to this lady for 30 years. She, she was a the neighbor to my storage bin when I was a contractor back in the day, a nurse. And, and she started to such and had a, a, a lady deep in religion, but no real relationship. Uh, and, and I would talk and talk and talk, and it just didn't go anywhere. Her favorite words are, and she calls about once every two weeks or three, uh, I say, well, how you doing? Same old, same old. Is that not a testimony of punishment? <laughs> Let the Christian not say that I'm just same old, same old. I'm the way I was last week, and I'm okay with it. 
What, what is wrong with that mentality, my friend? It means that, that I'm living, I'm, I still have flesh hanging all over me, that, that appetite is still eating me at times. But praise God, why don't we be like Jacob and run and say, Oh God, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go till I am blessed. That doesn't mean feel good. That means change my mind. That means change my character. And your character becomes mine. I'm not letting you go until people see Jesus in me. Hallelujah. I'm not letting you go. How does the flesh direct us? Let's go to Romans 9 and 14. We, we got time. Man. What part of my flesh am I struggling with? You name it. In your life. What is the, how does the flesh direct us? Well, one thing is fear. And that's what it's, it's uh, Nigeria. That was that nation. I knew I had it written down somewhere. And so instead of living in fear... They're living in the testimony, the victory. They're sharing the good news among themselves and picking each other up and the numbers are growing. When they find them to be Christian, they throw them in these camps and say, now you stay here, don't talk about it. And yet the camps are growing and growing and growing because they don't know what to do with them. People are coming to Christ. Sometimes we have fear that we're condemned, we'll be condemned by others. Fear of our physical life. Persecuted, we feel all this. It's just a part of the flesh. The worst thing that can happen to me in my mind on this earth, on this earth, is that I die. The best thing that can happen to me on this earth is that I die. Because then I go with the Lord. My goodness, where's the fear in that? And yet that hangs on us. It hangs on us. Deceit. In God's presence, his truth is revealed to us about himself and about me. I'm going to get a truthful answer from the Holy Spirit. But i got to listen to him. i got to throw my arms around him and find out what he, what he wants to tell me and, and get really immerse myself in him. But you don't do that from an easy chair. You don't do that just from, from same old, same old. Oh, thank God. Anybody want to stand and testify and say, Pastor, I want to tell you, I'm the same person and place today that I was a year ago. <laughs> Nobody, especially now. All of this requires effort. It requires commitment. It requires determination. It requires being tired of being a Christian with no victory in my life. Do you know that you can be a Christian with no, with no victory in this life? You have victory over, over your, your, in your relationship with Christ, but you don't have victory in this life to live this life the way that God wants you to live it. The flesh does not, the flesh will not control me. I have won. That's what Jacob said. This deceit, this all these things that was, would hinder me of being the man of God that, that God had chosen me to be for that period of time, I've gotten rid of it because I wrestled with God. I wouldn't let go until, and I came out of there the way God wanted me to be. And I want you to know something, folks. The encounter with God, this is the beautiful thing. The encounter with God will always change your life. Amen. It will never leave you the same. It will always make a difference in your life. Hallelujah. Well, I, I am going to end here, but I, I will read these verses. But you're not controlled, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Amen. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life 
He will give life to your mortal bodies at the same by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. That's the part that I want to uh, close on. We're not obligated to follow our flesh. Though that desire may be there, though that, that control still of the flesh, we have not, so we're not obligated, but so how do I get rid of that that I feel like, oh, I have to do what I have to do what I have to do. That's, that, that's what's, oh no, I have to feel this way. I have to, uh, I have to be hurt. I have to, uh, I have to, it, it goes on and on. No, you're not obligated. We are Christians. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We're not obligated to pay attention to the flesh. It's because we choose to. But when we enter into this encounter with God and we, we begin this, this struggle of, of, of killing the flesh and the Holy Spirit, we begin to enjoy that and we realize this is where God wants me to be. This is what God has chosen for me. So, this verse, for if you live by its dictates, you, you will die, but if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Sometimes we feel trapped. We, we buy into that uh, genetics and all kinds of things. I, this is just the way I am. God made the universe. He can recreate me. I ask him to all the time, Justin. He already did in Jesus Christ. And now I ask him, how many of you want and you desire the character of Jesus to be in you? I mean, full form, booming. See, that's what—that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm with you now, but I shall be in you. Well, if he's in us, then that means he wants to come out. He wants to reveal himself. And the flesh wants us to reveal ourselves our needs, our wants, and so forth. And, and that's what the flesh wants. But God has put us in, put Christ in us, and he wants to be revealed in us. So a good question for you to ask yourself often is, am I conducting my life the way that God wants me to? Is this how Christ is wanting me to conduct my life? How do we overcome the flesh? Not by just speaking to it, you don't overcome it with flesh overcoming flesh. You overcome any of those things by the Spirit. So you embrace the Spirit. You embrace the relationship with God. You put your arms out and you receive Christ, all that he's got. That's when you have the authority to say, in the name of Jesus. But if you're doing that in your flesh, you have no authority. But when I have spent time, when I have wrestled with God, when I've struggled with God and my flesh is, is put to the, to the back seat and now I'm walking with the authority of God, now I can walk over here and I can speak to those things that apply to my flesh and say in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. By the authority of Jesus Christ. But you have, it's just words that you're speaking from yourself. But you, you speak from the relationship that you have with God. The empowerment that God has given you. Then the name of Jesus means everything. Not some things, it means everything. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Would you stand, please? A different type of sermon today, I realize that. But I also realize. We're being pretty easy on ourselves as, as modern day Christians. God wants to do more for us and in us. He wants to do more. And my plea this morning is uh, let him do more. But you gotta pay the cost, you gotta pay the price, you gotta you you want to embrace him. I was 17 years old. I've shared parts of this with you. I was 17 years old on a, on a hill with a, a, a guy that's going to come down and see us here in about a week or two. And I was praying because I was bashful. I was 
I was, I, I knew in my heart, I knew in my heart what God had told me. That was at, at age 16, but I wasn't going to fool with this. I just had so many problems. Couldn't speak. I felt it. I had an inferiority complex because of uh, things in, in growing up and so forth. And I caught myself, found myself that night at about one, one or two in the morning on this hill, praying, praying, praying. And that's where I reached out with my arms and I struggled with God. First of all, telling him he really didn't know what he was doing. I didn't go too far. But I struggled with him and all of a sudden, from that night on, I knew that I was to be a pastor and a loving man and a man of mercy and those character traits that belong to Christ, those were supposed to be mine. And he took those, the negative things that was present and he threw those away because I was encountering him. I want to tell you something. Encountering God will never, never, never leave you the same before you got there. It will always make a difference. It will always change. Now that's a little, little light thing to you, but it was pretty dramatic to me. And you've gotten things in your life the same, to the same degree, and maybe even greater. But I want to encourage you this morning. Encounter God. Wrestle with God. It's, what is it? It's your flesh wrestling with God, trying to, trying to say, no, I don't want this. And God is saying, I've come down here to embrace my son. I've come down here to embrace you. There's victory for every believer. Amen. Don't live your life in defeat. Yes, Christians live their life in defeat. Not in defeat of the eternal, but in defeat of everyday living or being the... If you're not a light, if you're not, if you're not the, the joy of the Lord, there's a, there's a sense that that's defeat. Don't settle for it. Don't settle for it, church. Oh, hallelujah. Our church is ready to come alive. Don't settle. Don't settle for being in defeat. Hallelujah. Raise yourself up. Lift up your arms to God and say, Lord, here I am. I want to be the Jacob that you want me to be. Not what I was, but who you want me to be. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what I want us to do? I want us to all be, all be the, the light that God wants us to be this morning. And I want you to just come up. You don't even have to, just come as tight as you can. You don't have to come out of the aisles even. And just come in close as you can. I want to end with a prayer. 